friends, welcome to AI Flux. Today, I'm excited to be talking about what is probably the chonkiest GPU I've seen in recent memory, the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4090, available in the US now for 1600 US dollaroos. So this GPU is massive. Uh, as goofy as the shape is, um, ironically enough, they're actually pretty power efficient if you don't break the power cables. Uh, we'll talk about all this in just a bit. So, um, the reviews are in, the initial release was about a week ago, a bunch of YouTubers pretty much just made videos about how big it was, um, and the gaming benchmarks have been interesting. Uh, clearly, the focus with this release was uh, DLSS3, improving ray tracing, and uh, making what otherwise is just an incremental improvement in silicon from the previous generation. So, at a high level, NVIDIA is pretty proud of the fact to say, uh, to make a bold claim of a 2x performance increase in power efficiency, uh, 2x AI performance, which we'll get into. Um, I don't really agree with that metric. Maybe this applies to some of the more kitschy AI features in GeForce Now that are just kind of focused on streaming. Uh, and then, you know, a big focus on uh, their, their ray tracing cores. Um, I think this is pretty accurate, saying we could, they get 2x the ray tracing performance. So um, the only other thing of note here that I would mention is um, the massive improvement to their InVenc coprocessor, which now fully supports AV1. Uh, this is an open source codec that uh, I think is a great move forward just in live video. And yeah, what's interesting though is uh, this card is still limited. So the A5000s and basically the last generation of their enterprise cards all still basically by drivers and just by um, the kind of InVenc in these GPUs um, can handle more video throughput. And we'll get into why that's important for um, visual processing and ML, uh, since a lot of this is still pixel pushing and pushing out, um, in certain cases, video. So uh, as you can see here, um, games that have a ton of triangles and that benefit from ray tracing see huge improvements in performance. So I, I, it's not surprising to me, and it shouldn't be surprising to you, that they picked Flight Simulators and Cyberpunk 2077 for people who are still playing this game. Um, full disclosure, I'm not a huge gamer. Uh, I pretty much play Tarkov with a few of my friends from college here and there, uh, dabble in Factorio more than I should, and um, you know, occasionally download and update Star Citizen once a month. But uh, yeah, so that, just to, to be totally clear there, um, again, the ray tracing stuff is interesting. Replaying Portal 2 in a way that looks better would be kind of cool. Um, Cyberpunk 2077 is now playable at reasonable frame rates at 4K, which is pretty cool, if that's what you're into. And um, yeah, they have new features in their GeForce Now bits, which are kind of cool, and some features that they claim to improve uh, frame to frame latency. Um, here, what I think is cool is they, they shell some very gimmicky uh, AI features. I, I think they're interesting. I, it's not really anything of that I think is worth mentioning, though. Um, the NVIDIA encoder, in my opinion, is the most impressive side of this. And, um, you know, there's just more stuff going on that I think is more interesting outside of NVIDIA Omniverse and Canvas, which is, you know, a, an adaptation of a bunch of stuff that's kind of already been done and isn't really uh, breathtakingly new. So, yeah, and um, the raw specs here, you know, incremental improvement in CUDA cores, uh, the, the boost clock, to me, you know, comparing this in between silicon, to me, doesn't make much sense. Um, the GDDR6X, the amount of memory at 24 gigs, and the width of that link, so between VRAM and the GPU, is basically the same as it was in the 3090 and the 3090 Ti. Which is why, um, in my opinion, a lot of the specs we're going to look at today are just not that impressive. Um, again, it's an incremental increase, but compared to NVIDIA saying it's, it's a 2x performance boost, uh, I, I just don't agree. And there are some caveats to this and some things that are still exciting and um, a really great departure from uh, it's things NVIDIA has done in the past. But um, yeah, one of the, the misses is definitely... This power connector, uh, they kept this single 12-pin power connector to push 450 watts over. Uh, I run a bunch of A5000s, and A5000s, if you don't know, I'll put a picture up here, have this really cheap-looking uh, 
dual six pin to single eight pin connector. Um, so you have to run these with two uh, single rails on each of these. And I ran about eight of these doing ML stuff and some mining. So basically I was running these cards full tilt 24 seven for tens of days on end. And basically every single one of these, um, I'll show you a picture here of mine. Uh, the, and this is with a rated power supply with in a very well of an analytic case in a data center. So air, air conditioned space. Um, the insulation still deteriorated to a point that when I was pulling these cards out, a lot of these pigtails failed. And at times uh, the insulation just flaked off. So if these are moving or being shaken at all, or just being cycled, uh, the likelihood that something would have caught on fire was, was really high. Um, and I've created some of my own cables uh, that I soldered. It's pretty straightforward reverse engineering how those worked. Um, and uh, yeah, so fortunately, I don't have to worry about that now. And if you want some of those, um, email me and I'll, I'll make some and sell them to you. But that's not what this video is about. So uh, the price of $1,600, is this ridiculous? Um, I think it's, it's ridiculous if you were expecting the end of mining to really have any effect on pricing. Um, I wouldn't read into this as NVIDIA having problems making these. I think at this point, the uh, the good old diamond district trick of creating false scarcity is going to play well here. And with them unreleasing a bunch of GPU specs that I, I they've just decided they just didn't sound right, uh, I think we're going to see more of this. And the other thing that we're seeing is people are already scalping the heck out of these online. So they were available to buy yesterday and the day before, and they pretty much all went up, but we're going to talk about that later. What we're going to talk about now is what the title of the video says, which are ML benchmarks. So the current uh, best source that I'm following is Puget Systems. They've had great breakdowns in the past that are pretty academic. Um, they have an actual PhD who's worked with some of this stuff at a very low level and um, does a good job, I think, of providing important caveats and context as to what these really show and what they don't show. So the first two bench, so the benchmarks we're looking at are, uh, the first two are uh, HPL and HPCG. So these are supercomputing benchmarks that aren't necessarily supposed to do super well on pedestrian GPUs, um, even things like the A100 or the H100. But they provide a great example of um, filling up an entire GPU RAM's worth of space with big arrays of data and then performing matrix calculations, uh, just matrix math on them. Um, and then there are a few more that are scientific in nature, but just happen again to deal with um, a boatloads of data and doing complex math. The ones we're going to focus on are TensorFlow and PyTorch. And yeah, I think those are kind of the most interesting here uh, because those directly tie into stable diffusion and uh, in my opinion, reflect stable diffusion uh, performance pretty significantly. And then we're going to look at some specific uh, benchmarks done by EposVox, where he literally just ran stable diffusion. And that, I think, is a pretty clear indication of how you know, the 4090 in its current capacity runs stable diffusion. So um, if you want to read more about these, uh, I've linked this in the description below. Uh, as I said before, um, these first two benchmarks rely less on memory pushing things back and forth between the GPU and the host. So as I say here, um, this is a supercomputing benchmark that's been adapted to run on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, it's more so intended to target compute-focused GPUs, so A100, H100. Um, and uh, yeah, it's cool that it runs on RTX GPUs. Granted, uh, they have poor double precision, which is something that traditionally has been the case. And... Uh, yeah, so what you're going to see here is a vastly improved uh, double precision performance in the 4090, which is uh, interesting because this is a very big departure from how things have previously been. So, of course, a benchmark that benefits more from double precision stuff and double precision computation clearly will do better on the 4090 than the 3090. And that's what we see here. So basically, more than a 2x improvement very cool, um, but uh, but yeah. So makes again makes heavy use of double precision floating point capability, um, which is reduced on RTX GPUs. But for whatever reason, Nvidia thought we, yeah we should improve this on the forty ninety. Uh, so HPCG uh, high performance conjugate gradient. 
Um, this is more memory bound. So we start to see a more realistic uh, application here that's used by a lot of engineering solvers. So for instance, uh, simulation on SolidWorks, that kind of thing. So you can see here, we, we start to see the much more common uh, like 20 to 30% bump, which is interesting. And, and I think it, this is indicative of uh, minor silicon improvements and basically no improvement in uh, the memory uh, just plane of this GPU. Then we have an AMD um, or an AMD and uh, yeah, it's a molecular dynamics package. So it's a bit more of a GPU -y, uh, application. And you can see here again, there's a, you know, a significant improvement, but by no means 2x. Uh, this is you know another 20 to 30% which is pretty cool. Then we have lamps. Uh, this is a, a curious one because, uh, yeah, another molecular dynamics tool. And um, yeah, in this case, we get a doubling over the 4090. So it does hold up in this case. Another cool thing with these benchmarks is all of these are running in containers. So if you have Linux, uh, I very much recommend running uh, these AI models in a containerized format. It makes keeping configuration stuff much cleaner. In certain cases, uh, well, in a lot of cases, um, even just running in Docker is vastly more secure. So for people who've watched some of the security videos I've made about some of these models having nefarious things in them, you know, running them in a container isn't an absolute guarantee that's going to improve things. But yeah, we're seeing that it, performance is basically not even affected by this anymore, which is cool. And that was not the case, you know, five years ago. So um, now getting into the gritty of what really affects um, stable diffusion, some a lot of the stuff we talk about on this channel. So TensorFlow, um, this is cool because we, we're again massive improvement, but really only twenty to thirty percent. And again, these and what's cool with these also is these are doing things. It's a lot of loading stuff into VRAM, loading it off. Um, PyTorch is has sort of a just in time compilation. So uh, a lot of the bottleneck here is really um, it's memory bandwidth and it's how much memory you have. So if I'm being honest, I was kind of disappointed that we still only had 24 gigs of memory, which compared to two years ago is massive. But if anyone who's played around with um, an A5000 that has a much better um, just memory bandwidth to arguably a lower end GPU um, or something like an A100 that has a freakish amount of, of VRAM, uh, they're, they're just our undeniable advantages. And again, here uh, in training, we see, you know, like a healthy 30% improvement, which again, is very impressive coming from NVIDIA. Um, and I like that they make a point here, an RTX 4090 without NV, without NVLink. Uh, and what's curious is DeBauer, actually, he took apart one of these GPUs and figured out that like there are pins clearly, they're not populated, but there's an NV, there, there are pins for an NVLink connector in a lot of these uh, PCBs, and they're just not enabled. So this po really points me to think I, I would be excited to wait for a 4090 Ti that would maybe have uh, GDDR7X, which would, in my opinion, be a, a massive improvement. Like if you paired this same GPU with just much more memory bandwidth, that would be really interesting. Uh, and then especially seeing kind of the next generation of enterprise GPUs, that that would be exciting to me. So um, again, here, I think very reasonably, they say uh, one surprising result was how respectable the double precision floating point or FP64 was on the RTX 4090. FP64 performance is not a highlighted feature of RTX GPUs. Single precision FP32, typically 20 times FP64 for these GPUs. However, FP64 performance of the 4090 is competitive with 16 to 34 core CPUs. Uh, yeah, so this is cool. And they make a point about running code testing on a GPU. Um, I don't, that's a very academic use case for something this cool. Uh, but um, very cool. Puget Systems, uh, you know, really delivering per usual. Um, what's funny is I'm, I'm waiting for Lambda Labs to release some thoughts on this because um, they by far have the best tooling. And I still think if I was going to buy a dedicated, and this is not me shilling them. I don't own any of their stuff. Um, but I use a lot of their software tooling because it's free and it's just easy. And uh, yeah, so there are a few other interesting comments on Reddit about this. Um, r slash machine learning had a lot of great comments. They just linked to the Puget system stuff. And 
Yeah, I mean, they, they pretty much mentioned the same thing. The FP64 performance was impressive. Um, again, just mentioning memory bound. Um, th this is just going to limit the improvement. And uh, another one, see here they're mentioning um, operator fusion is done, for example, by PyTorch's JIT compiler. Helps a bit, but cannot fuse operator. So mentioning effectively that this is just a memory bandwidth issue. And um, yeah, you know, it's impressive. But again, my take from this is go buy a 3090 on eBay that was probably mined on. Maybe find one from EVGA that still has um, a fair bit of its warranty intact. Um, RMA it. And although an important caveat is in most cases, uh, stable diffusion will only utilize a single GPU. Uh, that's something a lot of people don't think about. Um, so yeah, 4090, if you want the, the fastest option out there in a single GPU. Uh, right now, that's the case. I'd wait six months and see what the next enterprise round looks like. Uh, that was pretty much the cadence from for the A5000 and A6000 release uh, relative to when the RTX 3090 came out. Maybe they won't be consistent, but, um, you know, interesting enough. And then uh, Chips and Cheese had another great breakdown of this. Again, you know, I'm not going to get too far into it, but pretty much ushering the same conclusion, which is this is mostly focused, uh, or Ada Lovelace, that this architecture focuses on ray tracing much more than AI performance generally. And I thought they had a really great breakdown as to why we see some of the improvements we do with the 4090. Um, they have a great breakdown of the basis of DLSS3, which to me, like I don't game a lot, um, so this is less impressive to me, but um, yeah, again, highly recommend this. Uh, in their in conclusion, they, they they pretty much say, Nvidia, NVIDIA's Ada Lovelace is a massive jump over Ampere. Top end SKUs feature huge, some count increases and significant increases in clock speed. Um, so performance, um, yeah. So great for rasterization workloads. Uh, but maybe not so much for core AI workloads, in as interesting as that is. So uh, issues with this running in Stable Diffusion. Um, there have been some issues integrating this into Automatic 11.11. A lot of these are probably configuration-based. Uh, you know, a, a brand new platform is never going to perfectly transition into everyone's perfect use of this. A, a lot of this is probably CUDA 12-based, which I think is pretty interesting. And yeah, I'm going to bring up Epos Vox's benchmark. Long story short, basically a 30 to 40% improvement in most cases. So still, I think if you can find one at MSRP, pretty good deal. Uh, I would recommend opting for a 3090 or if you want something that's a bit more robust, an A5000, although there's, they're pretty expensive. Like the A5000s, if we look here, you know, $1,200 basically, which kills me because I bought mine at like twice the cost of this, but I mind a bit, so I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, the 3090s, I mean, th th these are dipping even from what they were yesterday, uh, which, which is awesome. So $800 gets you a top end EVGA 3090 for, for the Win3. Um, even 3090 TIs were just around, well, that actually, that's a ripoff. So someone overpaid. <laughs> Someone overpaid two two thousand. Okay, that that's funny. But uh, yeah, so thirty ninety go on eBay, get a great deal. Uh, the forty ninety is being scalped as well, and it's getting worse. So like last night, there were multiple people buying these for thirty seven hundred dollars scalped. It looks like things have come down a bit. So you want um, want one for two thousand dollars? you're you're in luck and uh yeah yeah so fortunately i mean there, there's still that only just that single issue thread uh on the automatic 1111 github page uh you know would i buy these uh i to full disclosure i bought one i have no clue when it's actually going to show up so i'm eager to see if this plugs in these are going to be a huge pain to get into any kind of data center or any kind of rack situation so i'm probably going to test this for a bit p sell it and then wait for the next equivalent of the rtx a6000 so 
as always, uh, I hope everyone learned something. If you'd like us to improve or change what we're doing, leave us a comment below. We've had a lot of growth recently, so I think if someone probably posted a video somewhere, so if you did, thank you for doing that. And we'll, we will talk to you soon.